All right, how's it going, everybody? Uh, we are here on uh, Tuesday. We're going to look at our uh, second lecture of the week here, sections 2.1 and 2.2. Um, finally, getting into some of the, the better content here. I, I do always feel that even though stats is one of my all time favorite classes to teach, the first two weeks are rarely super exciting. Um, as you guys have seen, this is there's no way really around us doing a significant amount of like vocabulary discussion um, uh, in the first couple of weeks here. But uh, I am I'm excited that today at least we're going to draw some good graphs and some bad graphs. Um, <clears throat> and finally, we're going to get uh, next week. We're finally going to get into a bunch of good computation things. We're going to talk mean, median, mode, standard deviation. We're going to talk quartiles. Uh, uh, percentiles, a bunch of good stuff like that. So we're going to finally get some good uh, computational parts to this course as well coming up in the next, uh, kind of starting next week and we're kind of building to that right now with uh, the graphs that we have. We're going to want to be um, kind of computing some values that are associated with these graphs beginning next week. So um, so I, uh, th this class always, in my opinion, starts out a little bit slow, um, but uh, we're, we're wrapping up the slow parts right here, which is nice. Um, so we'll be, we'll be really kind of doing a little bit more next week rather than just understanding a few words and drawing a couple pictures. So where we're at right now is we are looking at sections 2.1 and 2.2 today. And I basically just listed all of their, their title together as one big long title since both of their titles are just lists of graphs that we want to be able to talk about. Um, so this is a nice two sections to cover together since this is really just like a long list of a bunch of the graphs that are associated with this course. Um, it's definitely the case that we do not equally care about all of these graphs um, in statistics generally, in this course specifically. Um, some of these are really important and we're going to use them all semester. Others of these are less important and we want to be able to read some information from them but aren't exactly the highlight of this class. Um, we at least want to understand what graphs are appropriate in what situations, like when should we be using a certain graph for a certain situation, is that appropriate or not? Um, and uh, we'll use a few examples of the book and partly because I like a couple of the book examples and partly because there's, well, there's one in particular that we'll talk about why I, I don't like that book example right there. Um, and the final thing I'll say here is that uh, if you're just reading this list of, of names up here, it's not obvious what's maybe more or less important. I can tell you certainly that histograms are going to be uh, almost certain the most important graph that we draw this semester. Um, and so understanding the histograms is going to be kind of most important. So I'm going to save that for the end just because I have the most to say about it. We'll also pop out into Excel and look at making some of these in Excel. And maybe before I actually get started here, now that I've mentioned that, I will also say um, for this week, you do have a, a, a by hand written homework assignment. Um, it is going to ask you to draw a series of histograms, a grand total of six histograms. I'm going to ask you to draw on that assignment. You are welcome to do that assignment by hand. I don't think that's going to be unreasonable at all. Um, you're also welcome to do that assignment in Excel. So when I show you the Excel things here, um, what, I, what I really want to be showing you is certainly more conceptual. Uh, you might want to be paying attention to the details of how I create them in Excel if you would like to follow along in Excel. If you know that for like this homework assignment and for future tests you're just going to draw your histograms by hand, which will always be an option to you, um, then that's fine. So you can kind of make a choice for yourself as when we get to the Excel part at the end, do you need the Excel instructions or do you just want to kind of see the concepts associated with the graphs that I create? Uh, the choice of whether or not you use Excel is up to you. I'll try and make sure that the things that we have available this semester are not you know, it's not like I'm going to give you like 300 data points and say make a histogram of this um, if it's going to be anything by hand. So I'll, I'll make sure that uh, doing these things by hand and by Excel, I, I want those to be somewhat comparable so that you're not just overwhelmed if you're choosing to do things by hand. Um, and while I guess I'm making small announcements like that, I, I guess I might as well say the one that's above my head right now. Um, our standard move is to do our, our class lectures on Mondays and Tuesdays. Um, and as it goes in my long, 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 long list of things that I need to feel out about how being online is different than being in person, um, officially this coming Monday, uh, 9-7, September 7th, is officially a day off of school. If this was a normal semester, all classes would be canceled on Monday. But since we all do this class sort of at our own leisure, it's been my intention that like on normal scheduled days off, uh, I'm just going to do my regular thing since it's not necessarily a deal to me that there's a day off. Um, you guys obviously can always watch the video the next day or whatever if that is a day off for you. 
Um, but I am I'm going on a trip this weekend, uh, and I am not yet sure the the other family uh, that is going on this trip. We haven't uh, fully established our plans yet. So there's a possibility that I'm still going to be out of town on Monday. Um, I'm not worrying about that too much. If I end up, if we end up deciding to do that, the next week we'll just kind of bump everything back a day. Our lectures will be on Tuesday and Wednesday instead of on Monday and Tuesday. So that's all I'm really planning on doing for next week. If that happens, um, I am certainly going to send you guys out a Canvas announcement by the end of this week to let you know what uh, what our actual plan is then for next week. So. Um, so I'll let you know. I haven't decided yet, but I'll make sure that everybody knows. So we are maybe pushing everything back a day next week. Um, and that'll be sensible since Monday is technically a day off anyway. All right. So here we are. Back to the stuff that we're looking at here. Let's go ahead and talk through these. So we've got stem leaf plots, line graphs, bar graphs, histograms, frequency plots, time series plots. That's one, two, three, four, five, six things we want to talk about here. Again, some are more important. Some are less important. Um, histograms are most important, so those are last. So let's kind of walk through each of these uh, graph types here and see what we see. So first things first, our stem and leaf graphs. Um, in each of these, I'm going to try and talk about what I like about them, what I don't like about them, and what data type uh, that these should be associated with that's sort of like kind of their limiting factors here. Stem and leaf plots or stem and leaf graphs are one of the great things about them is that they're really easy to make. They're in fact, I would say maybe the easiest of all of the data visualizations to produce. Um, it requires the least thinking, the least like careful writing because it's really you're just making a more special version of a list. This is barely a graph. Um, this is more of a smartly constructed list. Um, so that's what's good about this is that they're easy to make, easy to visualize. The bad thing about this is that you are pretty limited in your options. Um, one of the things that I'm going to say right here that it will be a lot easier to see once we do our examples, I say we are forced into a base 10 breakdown. Uh, what that means to me is that our groupings of data are always going to be based on um, a, a power of 10, right? So we're always going to get groupings of data that are like the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s it's really not possible for us to make stem and leaf graphs that are split differently. If I wanted to group my data by fours, I can't really do that in a stem and leaf graph. So one of the limitations for these is that you don't get to choose the intervals that break down your data. And that's a little bit annoying with these here. Um, what type of data are we looking at using for uh, for these guys here? This has to be numerical data, um, and this really should be discrete data. I, I suppose this is possible um, with uh, continuous data sets. We'll look at an example of that in a second and see that it just doesn't pan out that well. Uh, that discrete right there is maybe not so much of a rule. It's definitely got to be numerical data, that's for sure. Um, could be continuous, but I'm going to show you in a second that continuous stem and leaf plots end up being just a little worse, right? So let's take a look at these guys here. So um, I'm assuming that you read the book and seen the stem and leaf plots. To build the stem and leaf plot, all we want to do is always grab the leading chunks of each of our terms right here. And I say chunks because if these were three digit numbers, then I'd probably be grabbing the first two digits and leaving the last single digit as the leaf. So the leaf is always the final digit. The leaf is always the last digit of each number. The stems are all of the preceding numbers. So in this case here, I see that because of 33, I should have a stem of three. That's the 30 part. I should also have a leaf of three because I have a 33. So this is my representation of the number 33. That's the 30 part, and that is the three part right there. And I think what I want to do real quick is let me let me yeah let, uh, let me move this over. I want that to be right aligned. There we go. Uh, so uh, the next grouping right here, then I've I've, used, I've put the data point 33 in there. Next up is going to be uh, the 40s right here. So those three data points all start with a four. So I just get to write that four one single time. What are the 40s that we have? We have a 42 a 49 and a 49 right there. So this is my way of indicating 42, 49, and 49. And you should notice this is just barely a, a, a bare rewriting of the list that we already have, right? We're, we're not writing a handful of digits here um, and we're putting these into rows as organized by, as I said, powers of 10, our groupings of 10. We're counting by tens. Um, and so we can keep going here. So we've got our 50s row. I've got a 53, 55, 55. I've got my 60s row. I've got a 61, a 63, a 67, 60, 
68, 69, 69. So one of the really important things that you should see happening in all these stem and leaf plots here as I continue to build this is that we are not just making a list. The reason that we're doing this and doing this the way that we're doing this is because we're really trying to make a shape, not just a list right here. What you should be noticing is that I can visually see the representation of what types of responses that we're getting uh, or what types of scores that we're getting on this test by looking at how many quantities are in each of our rows right here. So in the 90s, we've got 92, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, and the 6, and then finally the tens row over here. So notice it's acceptable for our stems to have more than one digit. 10 is totally fine. Even if it had three or four digits, totally fine right there. We really just want our leaves to always be one digit long. Um, the nice thing to see here, the important thing to do with every stem and leaf plot is turn your head on the side to view this thing. If you turn your head sideways, then this should now look to you like a histogram. Um, and I do want to make one little like warning about some of these. Um, if you are making, and let me just write on this over here, um, one of the warnings with these is that you should notice that all of my things here are grouped perfectly vertically. So like look at this column right here, like the spacing of this column is exactly, uh, what did I not write on there? Wait, what, did I lose my pen here? There we go, we're back, okay. Um, so this column right here, like it's horizontal alignment matters, right? The fact that, so I'm gonna erase that in a second since it's kind of blocking my numbers there. But the point that that is exactly one horizontal column of values right there kind of matters because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get a visualization that the most common groupings of scores were the 60s and the 90s. Those were the two most common groupings of scores that I saw out there. And I can tell that not by really looking at the data, but just by looking at the length of the list of the how many uh, leaves were there on that one given stem, right? Um, so the thing that you want to avoid doing if you ever make a stem and leaf plot, like here would be an example of a bad stem and leaf plot. If I had leaves of like one, two, and three, what I don't want to do is like Here's a, a, a bad representation of a stem and leaf plot. This is a really bad stem and leaf plot because this doesn't give me any visual sense of, uh, for example, things like what was the most common grouping of 10 right here. The reason why this is a bad example is because all three of these look to be about the same length in, their, in terms of their list but this guy really had three groupings in the tens category. This really had six data values in the 20s, and this had four data values in the 30s, right? That's kind of what we're trying to visually see in a stem and leaf plot. So the one important thing I can say to you is make sure that your numbers are evenly spaced when you write all of your leaves in the stem and leaf plot, the way that these are all evenly spaced out here. If they're not evenly spaced, then you are losing that visual sense of things like what is the most common grouping? Here we should say 20s are the most common grouping kind of by far. It's not obvious when we, when we don't evenly space our values. So that's kind of like my one thing to say about stem and leaf plots. The purpose of graphing is to get a visual sense of distance of amount and you lose that visual sense of distance or amount if you don't equally space the numbers that you write over here. So make sure in stem and leaf plots, evenly space things so that we can get a visual sense of things like in this example, like, hey, six, 60s and 90s were the two most common grouping of 10 scores that we had. Right? Um, and uh, before we walk away from this one, I just wanna say, remember, this essentially is a histogram. These are bar heights. You should just turn your head 90 degrees and this looks like a histogram now where each of these are measuring the height of a bar. Um, we're gonna come back to specifically this example at the end when we talk about histograms because what I kinda of wanna say is, well, if this is a histogram, then I should have a little bit more control. What if I don't wanna split this over groups of 10? Uh, or, you know, to 10 scores, right? The 30s in one category. Maybe I want it like 30 to 35 and 36 to 40, stuff like that. I don't really have that option with the stem and leaf plot because that's just not how we write our numbers. So at the end, we're gonna come back to this data set and we're gonna say, how could we make other visualizations of this same data set that might be a little better or a little worse than the one that we are kind of currently looking at here? 
So I want to show you a less good example now of a stem and leaf plot to show you that these just don't work out well in all situations. All right. So here, this previous one, by the way, was a book example, 2.1. This is a Tony example, meaning I made this up and it's not in the book. So for this stem and leaf plot here, if I wanted to put these data into a stem and leaf plot, a class takes their temperatures uh, and records them. It looks like we're in Fahrenheit. Um, again, we're, we're, we're trapped into powers of 10, meaning um, every, every place value in a number, every additional place value is a power of 10 more than before. We go ones, tens, hundreds, right? So I always have to draw a line as to say, what breakdown am I looking at here? In this case, it looks like the smartest breakdown is gonna be for me to use my whole number parts as my stems and the decimal parts as leaves. Um, so I can go ahead and fill out this guy as well. It looks like we have a bunch of temperatures in the 97s and the 98s and the 99s. Uh, and what, what, are the, what are those? I wrote a couple dumb ones over here. There we go. Here we go. Okay. And it actually looks like we don't even actually have anything else that goes beyond that. It looks like, at least in this case here, nobody is... Uh, Nobody's sick, it looks like. I don't see any outrageous temperatures here. But if I was going to make this stem and leaf plot, this is not going to be as enlightening as the previous because, so I've got a 97.4, 97.7, 7, 7, 9. I've got a 98, 1, 1, 1, 2, 4, 4, 4, 5, 6, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8 9, 9. Oh, I didn't even make it. And then in the 99s, we've got a 0, 0, 2, 3. So what's good about this? What's bad about this? Well, in a sense, like I can still do it. Like I, I made my stem and leaf plot. This is technically the correct stem and leaf plot for this. The problem here is that our values are all kind of packed up around a couple stems. And there's not really a, a much better way that I can break this down. So you should notice here that temperature is certainly more of a continuous type of data because we can really have, in a sense, like any temperature, obviously human body temperature falls in a relatively narrow width, but like we could measure this finely. We could measure this to one, a tenth or even a hundredth of a degree. Things like class test scores are always gonna be whole numbers. It's always gonna be discrete data out there, right? And they're spread out a little bit more. These values are all real packed up around kind of our, our more typical um, temperatures of like the mid 98s, right, um, is what we see. The problem with this stem and leaf plot is it really just doesn't tell me much beyond the fact that most body temperatures are in the 98 degree range. But um, this doesn't give me as good of a sense of the spread of the data here. Like only having three columns in a histogram is pretty minimal again, right? And I can tip my head on the side and see this sort of looks like a histogram where the tallest bar is the 98 bar. But I really here almost certainly want to like break down my data into maybe more groups than just three. So sometimes stem and leaf plots just are bad graphs through no fault of your own or the data's own. It's just that these three stems are not a good enough spread for us to really kind of see the breakdown of the data out here. Um, you know, uh, so so sometimes just based on the spread of your data, stem and leaf plots aren't great. It's this whole thing where we are forced into base 10 breakdowns that makes this awkward for some types of data. You'll see in the book that they're gonna do things like uh, double-sided stem and leaf plots. There's also like half and half stem and leaf plots that you can do like breaking down by fives instead of by tens and stuff like that. Uh, to me, that's a whole bunch of work to fix a problem that's already better fixed with different solutions, which are histograms. So I very rarely, and with by very rarely, I mean never, go out of my way to make fancy stem and leaf plots. If I'm going to put time and effort into a graph, it's going to be a histogram instead. So in general, like the book does give you some other things with stem and leaf plots, unless you're making a pretty basic stem and leaf plot for discrete numerical data that is relatively well spread across different groups of tens, then if, if this is the way it goes, great. This is a good stem and leaf plot right here. Down here, this isn't exactly giving me a great sense of the spread of my data. I Rather than doing a fancier stem and leaf plot, I kind of might as well just make a histogram. And so again, we'll look at making different breakdowns of our groupings uh, when we talk histograms at the end here.
So this is just to say stem and leaf plots, super quick and easy, but they just don't work great for everything, uh, for all the data. Even if it's the type of data that's technically appropriate, sometimes the data is just not spread well enough to get a good distinction because it has to be a spread over groups of tens or hundreds or ones, stuff like that. Okay, I think that's all I have to say about stem and leaf plots. Uh, line graphs over here. So I've already yelled at you guys a little bit about line graphs. Um, and what we want to do here is make sure that we understand when it really is appropriate for line graphs. I'm assuming every single person in this class has seen 100 line graphs of various things in their lives. And I do think generally they're used uh, usually appropriately, but we want to really distinguish like what's a good and bad use case for this. The good thing that line graphs are supposed to do is they not just give you a sense of what data you have, but more of a sense of how that data changed between data points. Um, the cons for line graphs, which is the part that I'm sort of adding here, rel distinct from the book, is that I think that we should really only be using these for relatively specific data types. Um, and that data type is when we have continuous numerical data. Um, and most often time, um, I'm going to scroll back up super quickly here. You should see here that line graphs and time series graphs are two distinct uh, graphs on our list. I don't think that we should make huge distinctions between these. I really kind of feel like the statement I want to say to you is most all line graphs that you ever make in your life should be based on time. And that really basically just makes them a time series graph here. So that's kind of, I just kind of want to say those are mostly in the same grouping. So when we talk about this right here, I kind of want to show you right now why I don't agree with this book's example, show you a different example. Um, and then we'll, we'll see kind of a similar thing with our time series graphs out here. So um, this is supposed to help tell us how our data change. Um, and so let's see why I, I don't quite like this for our book example. So in the book example, uh, they say they survey 40 mothers. They ask how many times in a week the teenager, uh, a, a teenager must be reminded to do their chores. And they get the following uh, frequency table out of the sky right here. So the number of reminders and the frequency. So what the book does in this case is they go ahead and they make a line graph for this guy. So their line graph is going to look like, I'm going to come on down here and make my line graph their line graph is going to look like. So I'm, I'm making my graph right here. And even though this isn't a great graph choice, there's still right and wrong ways to make this graph. So let's still at least make a good line graph, even though I don't think it's the appropriate graph for this situation. So anytime we're measuring frequency, it's pretty much always the case that our frequency is going up here on our vertical axis. I'm seeing that 14 is the largest thing that I need to get to. I usually give myself, I don't know, I, I like groupings of like five and stuff like that. So maybe I'll put like 15 as my largest here, and then that can allow me to do like five and 10 for some other evenly spaced uh, groupings right here. Um, and certainly we can put some more tick marks on there. A little bit hard for me to do this in Word here. So I'm gonna just kind of slightly make some visual estimates here, but I know that you guys will be able to be more careful and you're gonna do a great job. So uh, on the X axis, we're gonna get how many reminders since the frequency was on the Y, how many reminders should be on the X. I know that we're going out to five as our upper bound here, so four, three, two, one, and zero. And notice zero actually is one of our important locations on here. So what they do is they plot each of these as points on a graph. Uh, zero reminders, I should be appropriate here. I'm gonna label all my stuff. Reminders is down here. So zero reminders was associated with two parents reporting that they need to give two reminders. Uh, sorry two parents reported needing to give zero reminders. So the frequency is two, that's the number of parents, the number of reminders is zero. Uh, how many parents had to give one reminder? And that is five. How many parents had to give two reminders? That is eight. How many parents had to give three reminders? That is 14. How many parents had to give four reminders? Seven. How many parents had to give five reminders? Four. So what the book does is they proceed to draw the lines that are in between each of these dots. The reason why I don't like this is because these connected lines seem to suggest to me that we can go ahead and infer the potential for other data points to be in between here. Right? What this says to me is it seems like I can infer 
that about in this in this scenario here and by the way let me scroll back up just so i can reference some percentages this was out of 40 total mothers right so 40 mothers were asked it seems to me then if these are lines really connecting these then i want to say like out of 40 mothers maybe about uh seven mothers typically have to give one and one half reminders right does that make sense as a data point about seven out of 40 parents need to give one and a half reminders to do their chores. And I would say no, because it doesn't make sense to me to give a half of a reminder to do a chore. So I think that the reason why this is bad is because our data here is very much discreet. It doesn't make sense to have 2.6 reminders to clean your room. I think that we should not ever be connecting data points for discrete graphs because I don't want to be suggesting that we should infer some partial piece of information halfway between two of those data points right there. That doesn't quite make sense to me. I think that this therefore would be better done as a bar graph um, or, or honestly even a histogram right here. Um, but again, when I connect lines between data points, what that feels to me like I'm supposed to be doing is inferring that there could have potentially been other data points on that piece of the curve. And that's just not true in a discrete setting right here. We do just jump from one reminder to two reminders. There is no uh, partial reminder that exists in between those. And so connecting those data points does not seem appropriate to me. I really think that a much better way to do this would have just been with a, uh, so we're at zero here. Let me just draw our quick bar graph for this guy. One, two, three, four, five. I'm still going up to 15. Got my 10 and my five breakdown here. I'm doing a little bit worse job, not labeled my stuff. Um, and by the way, I'm gonna do this kind of the way that uh, I think that I asked you some in the homework to, that are gonna ask you to do it this way. And uh, I think in the homework in the My Open Math, it's gonna ask you to make some histograms that essentially just says graph the tops of the bars and then add some vertical lines to make them look like blocks. It's really, they're just using like a graphing application to try and get you to make bar graphs, which are a little bit different or histograms here. Um, so the first bar height is at two. The second bar height is at five. The next bar height uh, for how many, ooh, ooh, sorry, by the way, I kind of actually want to go back and change this here. I think I did something a little bit weird right here. Um, I think that I would like to place these, since this is going to be a bar graph, I think I would like to instead, oh, that's, that's not the number that comes after zero. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to label where these bars are. So the bar that goes of, uh, oh, sorry, I got to put my 15, 10, and 5 back on here. Okay, now I'm ready. I wanted to set those bars to be a little bit more centered on their value. So we should be looking now at the bar of height 2 is right there. The bar of height 5 there for 1. The bar of height 8 there for 2. The bar of height 14 for 3. The bar of height 7 for 4. And the bar of height 4 for 5. Now I can kind of finish those bars by just putting their, their vertical components on them, right? The top of the bar is really the height of the bar and set so the important part. So your homework might ask you to do some, some bar height stuff right there. Um, there we go. So we got our bar graph now. So I just think that this is a bit more of a better visual representation because it doesn't make sense for me to talk about partial values that are in between each of these discrete values. So I, I in my opinion, the book's graph that looks like this is, this is not an appropriate use case because I don't think that we should be connecting points when we are collecting discrete data. Since it's not possible to have a partial reminder, it's not, and this goes with like, how, how, many, how many kids are in your family, right? Like there is no 2.7 answer. I don't think it would be appropriate to connect those type of data points with lines either because we shouldn't be inferring some fractional number uh, that's in, in between them out there. So I think that a bar graph is better here because this data is discrete. The number of reminders is discrete. If it was continuous data, like time often is, which is why I think that our line graphs are best done as time series graphs. Time is almost always a continuous variable. Um, and so in a lot of those cases, it makes a lot more sense for us to connect those with lines. We'll come back to this one here in a little bit. So why do I not like book example 2.4? I don't think that we should ever connect data points with lines when those are discrete data points. If it's not possible for us to achieve values that are in between them, then I don't think that we should connect them with a line. 
Bar graphs, we've already talked about these. I'm not gonna draw any new ones right here. The good thing about bar graphs is that they're really easy to make. You just saw me whip it out right there without doing any amount. I even made some mistakes, went back, fixed it, it was easy. Uh, there's really few limitations on bar graphs. When we talked about bar graphs relative to pie graphs, uh, we noticed that the one distinction there is that if you're ever gonna make a pie chart or a pie graph, pie graphs have to have all 100% of the data. Bar graphs don't. Bar graphs, you're welcome to just leave stuff off and it really doesn't affect our ability necessarily to interpret the other parts. Um, the other thing that's nice about bar graphs, we saw this in yesterday's lecture, we can use absolutes or relative frequencies. The heights of your bars can either be measuring the actual counts, that's our absolute frequency, and that's what we did in our previous example. Over here, these were absolute frequencies because it was literally the count. This was literally us saying two out of 40, five out of 40, stuff like that. Alternatively, we could have made this vertical axis percentages out of 100%, and then we would have got things like, uh, okay, I'm trying to like look for ones I know. Uh, two out of 40 is one out of 20, so that would have represented 5%. And we could have done either right there. All of our bar heights would have been equivalent proportional to one another. It's really just a renaming of the y-axis and a renumbering of the y-axis. So the good thing about bar graphs is they have few limitations. You don't have to have all of your data on a bar graph. You don't have to have 100%. And you can list your frequencies as either true counts or as percentages out of the whole. And that doesn't uh, really affect our reading of the graph either. There aren't really major drawbacks to bar graphs. I think this is one of our like overall better graphs. I, I might go far, so far as to say this is probably our second best graph after, after histogram, but um, graphing categorical data, graphing qualitative data rather than numerical data, you're always just getting a little bit less good visual information by looking at that graph. So there's nothing wrong with bar graphs inherently, but because they are about categorical data, it's just a little bit less enlightening, I think, to just see any visualization of categorical data, basically. It's just uh, it's stuff that essentially is almost as good in a table as a, as a graph, often, um, and numerical data, that's really not the case. Only other thing to say about this, as far as our words for bar graph goes, are uh, if our categorical is data is nominal, remember it's based on a name only, so that would be things like I bike to school, I drive to school, I take a bus to school, our three categories are bikers, drivers, riders. Um, if that's the case, then if we ordered our columns from most common to least common or vice versa, then we refer to that as a Pareto diagram. That's just an ordered bar graph is all that means right there. Um, and I'll show you in a second that Excel has an option to do that for us. Um, I pretty much never ever choose that option though and I'll, and I'll explain to you why right there. So uh, I'm just gonna say for bar graphs, we drew an example in the last problem I, because there it is right there. There's the bar graph that we drew right there. Um, and I should also say, uh, my other thing to say about this is it certainly wouldn't have been terribly inappropriate for us to make this a histogram because this is numerical data. Um, I am going to make some more uh, arguments right here, or at least the uh, possibility of some arguments here. Um, and this is a thing, again, this is going to happen all, all, all semester here where there's not necessarily a truly right or truly right or wrong answer to something. As long as you can make a valid argument, then I agree with it. In this case here, I think it would be valid for you to argue that we should have made this a histogram instead of a bar graph. Histograms are for when we have numerical data that it, we are distinguishing upon on the x-axis here. And this certainly looks numerical to me. We do go from zero to one to two to three to four to five. The reason why I think that this could be argued as appropriately as a bar graph and maybe shouldn't be a histogram. Um, and now I am a parent, but my child is only 10 months old. So I'm not going to claim that I'm familiar with telling my child reminders to do his chores. Well, I still tell him, he just doesn't understand what I'm saying yet. Um, but I think, I, I'm gonna go ahead and take a guess here that most parents would agree that the difference between one and two reminders is not the same as the difference between four and five reminders. And I think all of us as children are also aware of that, right? So if it's not the case that the true measurement of distance from zero to one is the same as one to two is the same as two to three, if those aren't all really measurably the same, or if it couldn't be really measured, then that's what makes it appropriate for us to consider these as more of categories rather than as measurements here. Um, 
And, and honestly, I, I really do think that your choice as to make this a bar graph, which I currently have, versus a histogram where there's no gaps, uh, honestly probably has a lot to do with whether you're a parent or not and view these as measurably the same between each one or as being more of categories of numbers of times that you have to tell your children. And I, and I, and I can honestly say I don't think there's a true right or wrong answer here. I think that valid arguments can be made both ways. Um, and as long as you defend yourself in these cases, I will be okay with that. You know, there might be cases where I say to you, that's weird. Uh, why did you make that a bar graph? Don't just assume you're wrong, say, because these are categories, Tony, because I don't think that you can measure the difference between two and three reminders for a child to do their chores, stuff like that. Uh, it's okay to defend yourself. A lot of these things, there's not a true right or true wrong answer, um, but we should have reasons why we think things are a little bit more right or more wrong. Honestly, same thing with my line graph. I'm not saying this is straight up a wrong thing to do, but I, in my opinion, I have a good reason why I think it's a bad choice to do this, and it's because there's no in-between data points that we can infer. So be confident in making your own arguments, right? So we drew a bar graph there. Remember the essential difference between bar graphs and histograms. You guys have already seen this picture. When we make bar graphs or bar charts, it is always categorical data. And because there's not a measurable difference between each group, we put a gap there. Histograms are always measuring numerical data. It's always going to be a range of data that is covered by each of our bars. Therefore, there should be no gap because the, exactly where one bar ends is where the next bar begins. This bar includes like 19.99999. This bar picks up right here with 20.000, right? There's no gaps between them. I don't have a way to measure the distance from China to the US, or I shouldn't say distance, just measure what it is that we're measuring between China and the US right here. There is no measure between them. And so we leave a gap to indicate that right there. So just kind of trying to remember our our essential difference between categorical bar charts and numerical bar charts. Numerical bar charts are histograms. Frequency polygons. Uh, this is one where the first thing I have to say is nope. Um, and that was my first inclination when we were in the book. Then I kind of decided that this there is something that's worth saying about these, but the deal with frequency polygons is that you should really pretty much never be just standalone drawing a frequency polygon. Really, the fact of the matter is I am going to draw dozens and dozens and dozens of frequency polygons over the course of this semester. I just don't think of them as frequency polygons. To me, it's just a little diagram that I draw. So when I say I use them intuitively, I don't think of this as its own graph. Um, I, I initially planned to sort of just discard this from the lecture because, and then I was like, oh wait, I guess I draw those all the time. I just don't think of these as some like formalized thing. So I just want to show you what they're kind of essentially saying when we talk frequency polygons. What they do is they help us compare distributions of data. Um, I really don't think we should ever use them as a standalone graph. Um, but they do help us show um, relationships between data in numerical continuous settings here. I think that these are great partners for histograms. Pretty much every histogram I'm gonna draw this semester kind of is partnered in a little sense with a frequency polygon. So let me just draw a couple of quick sketches to show you what I mean here. What we're gonna end up doing this section, in, or sorry, this chapter, and then it's going to flow into our next chapter here is we're gonna draw some histograms. So it might be that we're talking about a histogram that is measuring, so let's say this one here is maybe um, wait times at the airport. How, how delayed is your flight might be something that I'm asking people. And I'm asking like 100 people as they come off the plane, right? And so maybe what I'm seeing here, and I'm not I'm trying to not even, how, how, how on time was your flight, right? And so I'm gonna say here, Maybe that we are at, uh, maybe I'm breaking this down into five minute intervals right here where we are at, uh, let me, oh yeah, let me back this up a little bit right here. Okay. So I'm thinking here, it might be the case that we're actually saying that some people leave a little bit early. These are all, all of our people that leave up to within five minutes earlier than their flight. These are all the people that left within five minutes of their intended flight time. The tallest column is going to be people that left between five minutes and 10 minutes after their scheduled departure time. This next column here will be 10 to 15, 20, 25, 
30. My, my columns got a little bit narrower there, didn't they? There, this is our this is our 40 to 45 late, and then 45 to 50. This is our 50 to 55. So I drew this really bad because I, I kind of ran out of room down there. Um, but I'm trying to give you our, our sense of bounds on each of these guys right here. What we might want to do is recognize uh, that we can sort of think of there being sort of like data points at the top of each of our bars right here. And we could think of drawing, in a sense, our, our curve like we just did through our frequency thing over here, our, our frequency polygon. Um, and we could draw an equivalent curve that's supposed to represent the data that's on this graph. So this might look to me something like this. So this is our histogram. And this is our frequent, uh, excuse me, yeah, let me make sure, same words, right? This is our frequency polygon right here. And it's supposed to be called a polygon because it's they're, they're making a bunch of straight line pieces with this. I made a more of like a frequency curve instead of a frequency polygon here, um, but kind of whatever, that's okay. Um, so I'm just trying to mark like the same data points that I saw before. So the whole point here is that this is a curve or polygon that's supposed to be indicating to me uh, the spread of my data, right? So what I've kind of done here is I've lost a little sense of like counts. I don't feel like I'm looking at frequencies so much, but I do see things like now, for example, and the fact that this tallest point right there is at like 7.5 minutes. This now allows me to make more distributional uh, comparisons here to say at this given airport, it seems like the most common thing is for your flight to leave seven and a half minutes late. It seems like a lot of people experience small delays, but the small few people experience larger delays of, you know, where we can identify where we're at of like 30 minutes or more. Very few people experience those, right? So the purpose of a frequency polygon is intended to just mimic a histogram. It's sort of like the curve that follows exactly the same trends as your histogram. Here, what we're going to discuss, our verbiage for this next week, is that we're going to see that this is not really symmetrically spread left to right. It looks like this has a long tail only on the right side. So one of our words next week will be that we're going to say this appears to be a right skewed distribution. And that is because the tail is to the right. We'll also see some left tail distributions, some left skewed distributions, and we'll also see some symmetric distributions. The thing that's nice about the frequency polygons is that we can make comparisons. Maybe we get a second airport's data and we say, oh, this is at LaGuardia over here, but maybe over here, this is in Atlanta. And maybe what we're gonna find is that the curve looks very similar, but maybe Atlanta's curve is like just a little bit further to the right than LaGuardia's curve or something like that. I got a little lumpy on that on the back end. Let me try that again right here. Um, maybe it's, you know, pretty similar and still dies off. So then I could maybe say, oh, if this is, you know, LaGuardia and this is Atlanta, maybe what I can tell here is there's still a very small chance that we're going to see a 30 minute wait or longer, but it maybe we could make then the interpretation that says things like, oh, it seems like the average person at uh, Atlanta waits about four and a half minutes longer than the average person at LaGuardia, things like this. So it's maybe gonna help get us a sense of the spread of our data, the distribution of our data, the shape of the overall graph that we're looking at. So this kind of removes our focus from individual bars and looking more at the overall shape and the spread so we can make more broad generalizations. So as I said, I really don't think about this as its standalone thing. I am going to draw a lot of histograms this semester and what's eventually gonna happen is I'm gonna get just tired of drawing bars and I'm just gonna draw this to represent the same histogram idea out here, all right? So frequency curves and polygons are essentially just a uh, it's almost just sort of like a blur your vision and look at a histogram. It's sort of like saying, look at a histogram, but don't look at any fine detail. Only look at the general trend of the data and its distribution. And the reason it's good is because it helps us make comparisons across multiple different histograms or trends. I can see that this essentially, or if I was better at drawing on my tablet, this has essentially the same shape as the previous, but it looks like the data is centered in a slightly different location. So I'm making broad generalizations about the whole data set when I look at this, as opposed to 
making maybe individual statements about individual bar heights in the histogram. But again, these are really partners. These are in a sense showing me quite a lot of the same stuff. There's gonna be times this semester where a problem is gonna say draw a histogram and you're gonna see me draw this curve over here and vice versa. Um, and so these are, I don't wanna say they're interchangeable, um, but I also do end up treating that way, them that way a little bit. Um, so histograms are histograms, they have bars. Um, Frequency polygons are, are polygons or curves, straight lines or curves connecting data points here. I can tell you, I'll never ask you to just straight up draw one of these standalone. Like this is always going to be to say, discuss the shape of your histogram. And you are going to draw the world's quickest sketch that's gonna look like this. And you're gonna say, the distribution of the, of the data seem to be right skewed, stuff like that out there. So this very much is a partner to a histogram. It's more of a, rather than looking at the individual pieces of a histogram, you look at everything collectively to make comparisons from histogram to histogram, stuff like that. So there's my frequency uh, polygon thing. Um, yeah, never, never really standalone, usually as an alternate representation of a histogram to get better, more generic information, or not necessarily better, just more general information. So this brings us on to time series graphs. Um, time series graphs are good because these allow us to do that thing that I wanted to do earlier that we couldn't. It allows us to sort of infer data points that exist between data points that we have. I think that was a kind of bad thing for us to do in the how many times did a parent have to remind their child situation because we can't have in between data points in that set. However, if our data is continuous, which almost all time data is always measured continuously, then it makes more sense for us to interpret in between. So let's just do a quick uh, example here. It's a Tony example, not a book example. Um, let's just draw this quick time series graph. And the point is, is that uh, there's no, nothing gonna be super weird here. I've got the uh, US field production of crude oil in thousands of barrels per day. Um, from 1900 to 2010. So there's 12 total data points right here. And you should notice, and I mean, before I even draw the graph, it's absolutely appropriate for you to say things like, apparently in about the year 1905, we were probably producing somewhere around 7,500,000 barrels of oil per day. It makes sense for me to do an in-between estimate in this case because the year 1905 did happen and it's a guarantee that we must have transitioned through 750 barrels a day on our way from 500 barrels a day to 1,000 barrels a day. Like these are continuously changing things. So I know that that year exists and I know that that amount of production exists. Right, so it does make sense for me to connect these um, with some dots right here. So if I were to make a quick uh, a time series sketch for this one, it's not gonna look uh, any different from any graph I think that you've uh, seen in the past here. So I'm gonna get my time always on the x-axis out here. So I'm gonna get uh, years zero. Maybe I'll try and do this like this, yeah. Zero one, or sorry, that's one zero, 20, or 1910. 1920, 1930, 40, 50, 60, 2000, 2010. So I've got my time axis here. Over here, again, I, I, I always wanna look at my upper bound first to help me out right here. Um, in this case, I do see that a lot of my values are quite a bit smaller than the upper bound. So maybe what I'm gonna do right here is mark 12,000 uh, barrels. And really 12 is gonna be my thousands. And these are measured in thousands already. So this is really like thousand to thousands. So this is really millions of barrels. I'm gonna go up to 12. I know that one of my data points will be a bare smidge higher than that line right there. If I go halfway down from 12, that gets me to six. Halfway in between those is nine and three. And then I can do my one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So now I can go ahead and plot all my points out here, right? In the year 1900, we were at 500. So that's halfway between zero and one on that axis. Then we go up to 1000. And then we go up to 2. Point, oh wait, yeah, 1,000. And then almost 3,000 here, 2.7. And then about three and a half in the year 1930. 
and then five in the year 1940, five million barrels per day, uh, seven million barrels per day in 1950, nine million barrels per day in 60. Uh, but then we dip back down, eight and a half in 70. And then we dip down a little more, 7.6 in 80. Uh, we dip down even more, 5.8 in 90. 5.3, we're even a little bit lower in 2000. But then we decide that we're not super interested in being really dependent on other people for oil, which, while I'm not a huge fan of drilling, dependence on people that we're going to be mean to is not a really good idea. And so if we're going to be mean to the people that make all the oil, then we had better make our own. And so we get another data point up there at 2010. And the very important thing about a time series graph is that the last step is connecting the dot. The whole point of this. All right, here we go. Oh my gosh, I've touched every dot so far. All right. So the whole point of a time series graph is that it does make sense for us to read in between values out there, right? Now I can come back to this guy right here and say, okay, I should say 1945 is a bad year to make estimates about things. Um, you know, World War II made everything a little bit weird right there. Um, but the point is, it makes sense for me to estimate that in the year 1945, we were producing about 6 million barrels per day, stuff like that. Because these data are continuous, it makes sense for us to infer in between values. So let me just say this right there. This makes sense. I do want to infer other values on this curve. And even though they're not exact because there's not a data point right there, it's a perfectly reasonable estimate for me to make in that sense right there. Versus if we scroll back up, I know I hate doing the scrolling when I've got all my drawing on the screen. This right here, I just want to highlight, this does not make sense. So my general argument to you is only connect data points with a line if it makes sense to you that you can infer data points in between that line sensibly in the context of the problem. Here, it doesn't make sense to have fractional reminders, but down here, it does make sense to have years that are in between tens of years. It makes sense to have any number of barrels of oil per day being produced. Um, so all the in-betweeners make sense there. So connect things with lines or curves when that is actually a sensible thing to do, when those data points could actually exist. So I don't think there's anything too crazy about what I just did right there. It's really just the finger shake at you to say, don't use this when you shouldn't use this. Only use it when it makes sense to connect your data points. And by the way, um, EIA is the Energy Information Administration, um, which I had no idea is a thing. But basically, this is uh, the group that's responsible for informing. Oh, why in the world did that just highlight right there? Uh, that is the group that's in, responsible for sort of uh, publicly uh, sharing all legally because so much information is legally required to be shared, right? Like, uh, like the state of California has to report to the federal government, the number of barrels of oil produced on state lands or st stuff like that. So all of the federally mandated data reporting that's associated with any energy thing. So this is oil, natural gas, all these things. Uh, EIA.gov is like a source of data for a lot of those things or for all those things required that the government reports it to the people is required that states report it to the federal government. Um, so this is interesting. It's just a bunch of good data. That's right there. I'll be pulling other things from that site this semester just because uh, I don't know. I think these things are interesting. It's interesting to see that we sort of pr produce more and more oil over time, which makes sense. But then we can kind of talk about historical things that happened out here and cultural things that caused us to buy more oil from other people, but then produce more ourselves, stuff like that. So uh, EIA does have a bunch of cool data at it. So there we go. There are time series graphs. Nothing too weird. Do it when time is your uh, is one of your variables and put it on your x-axis down there. So now we get to histograms, the thing that's kind of the most important thing here. Um, I'd say it's by far the most important graph of the semester. We're going to draw so many histograms and their equivalent uh, frequency polygons or frequency curves out there like we did earlier. The pros to histograms is that they're easy to make. They're super flexible. You have so many choices that honestly the con to histograms is that you have so many choices that it's hard to pick sometimes. 
Um, they visually indicate the center and spread of data. That's almost something that I feel like is more the responsibility of the frequency polygon rather than the histogram itself. But I always just see that curve that the, that the histogram bars are making automatically. Like I said, I do that intuitively. Um, histograms are best for our numerical continuous data right here. We're going to categorize things into groups. This is best for when we take numerical continuous data, but then we put the continuous data, categorize it into its own groups. Um, so uh, the first thing that we want to look at is just recognizing that stem and leaf plots are the same thing as histograms. Um, they're just turned on their side with fewer options. The stem and leaf plots are. Stem and leaf plots, you don't get the choice of how wide each of your categories are. It's always got to be that grouping of powers of 10. Um, whereas histograms, we have any, any options available to us. So let me go re-grab uh, the, the 2.1 example that we did. And let's just rewrite this as a histogram. So here's the table. Let me just get this whole table. Will you allow me to do it? Come on, Microsoft Word, be my friend. Happy. I think the hardest part of my whole semester is managing tables in Microsoft Word. Okay. Yeah, all right. Didn't even move everything else around. So the important thing to see here is that this is a histogram. I can make a histogram out of exactly what we're looking at right here, and it's going to look essentially the same. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start marking some points on the on the axis here. I'm going to start this guy at 30. So let's just mark it all the way up to the 100 right there. 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. So one of the important things here is I am intentionally marking tick marks and not locations. Let me scroll back up and show you a, a, a distinction real quick here. This is in fact what I did, what I thought, what I felt was wrong about my bar graph, right? When I made this bar graph earlier, I started but then stopped. And that was because I really wanted this to be a bar graph and not a histogram. Here I put zero centered underneath this bar because I considered zero to be a category of response. If your response was zero, I placed you into the category of zero rather than the like measurement of zero, right? I'm thinking of this as a bar graph as these being categories. So I marked where on the axis that the zero response will be. Similarly down here, USA is centered underneath the bar. The difference is that when I make this histogram over here, I'm still marking tick marks on the axis and my bar height will go up to that tick mark. So what you know is that right here are all the values like 35, right? Uh, 35 should certainly be right where my mouse is right now. And that's because that's between 30 and 40. So whatever bar I build here, I'm gonna build a bar where this is essentially my vertical parts, these tick marks that I've made. This should contain the things between 30 and 40. The only question we have to ask ourselves is, does it contain the end point or not? The typical thing to do in these cases is to include the lower bound, 30, but to disclude the upper bound. So whatever bar I make that's going to go right here, it's going to really cover me from like 30 up to like 39.9 is what's going to cover me for this bar. The 40 is going to fall into the next. So the lower bound is included. The upper bound is typically not included, but we'll see in this case here. Um, it kind of helps because otherwise we'd have to make our own whole bar uh, for 100 and I'm, I'm not, not going to do that there. So we'll see that we're going to get a little bit of choice with some of these things out here. Um, and we'll also see that we fix these problems differently. Right now I'm doing the default selection of grouping by tens, but it's not necessarily the case that we want to do that. And we're going to talk about that after we make this here. So first things first, how many people scored up to 30? Well, nobody scored below 30. So that's a technically a bar right there of height zero. Oh, I guess I should also, by the way, I need some frequencies over here. How many people scored in this grouping, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. These are always going to be my frequencies on this axis over here. So how many people scored really from 30 to 39? Well, I have that in my stem and leaf plot right there. It's one, right? How many people scored from 40 to 49? Three of them. 
Again, notice you can just make your bar heights and that's kind of good enough right there. Uh, I'll add my vertical parts later for my bars. How many people scored from 50 to 60? Another three. How many people scored from 60 to 70? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. Oh, I need another tick. How many people scored from 70 to 80? Here's my 70s to 80s. There's four of them. Here's my 80s to 90s. There's five of them. Here's my 90s to 100. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. And again, we kind of have this little, uh, I agree, this is a bit of a dilemma right here. I'm going to go ahead and count this as eight values right here, but you should notice I'm now following a slightly different rule for one bin than the rest of the bins. And that's because I want to not have a, a 100 as a standalone bin right there. So this is actually going to bring us out to eight right here. But again, this is just a little bit of a choice right here. I'm going to make different choices in a minute that are going to make that not uh, a little weird thing right there. So... If I want to finish making this a histogram now, oh, it's hard to get those long vertical bars for me. Okay, okay. So here we are now as a histogram. There we go. All right, so now we made a histogram. Um, and again, we're thinking to ourselves that our rule for these is that we should be including the lower bound but discluding the upper bound, but that makes it a problem for our final upper bound because it will always be discluded then. Um, Excel fixes this problem in a way that I don't really like a lot. Uh, and this is one of those things where we're not trying to do something super perfect. We're trying to do something that's going to give us a really good idea of what we're looking at. And this does that. This gives me the really good idea that a majority of students scored in the 60s and in the 90s. Those are the two most common groupings to score in. I can actually say I think the book did a good job making up numbers for this because I do feel like this is often representative of a lot of the tests that I give. There's the people that knew what they were doing mostly, and there's the people that didn't know what they were doing mostly and I usually see two separate peaks when I draw the histograms for my data of my class tests out there um, and it's very often the case that there's like the prepared people and the not prepared people are are broadly the typical two categories in, in most tests out there um, so again the, the thing that you should take a moment to do right now is realize that if you just turn your head this way then the stem and leaf plot is drawing the exact same graph as this graph that we just drew right here with your head upright. It's the exact same shape. These are the tallest two columns. These are the tallest two columns right here, right? We, we still get all those same shape ideas out there. That the column heights are the same. Here they're just row lengths versus column heights, right? So here's my beef. One, we've got this little issue over here with the fact that this bin is technically following a different set of rules than all of these other bins are following. These all disclude their upper bounds. This included its upper bound. So let's talk a little bit about bins, bin width, data classes, class midpoints, stuff like that. These are just some uh, pretty easy vocab words here. Um, so in this case right here, I would say that our bins, those are all of our intervals that we're using right here. So our bins are going to be marked off by 30, 40, 50. The bins, when I list my bins as a list, I'm listing what are all the boundaries of all of the the terms that we're looking at here so in this case i might list my bins as like the 30s through the 100s right there uh, what is our bin width in each case how many uh terms are associated with each bin width well the, each bin width has a width of 10 because there are 10 values right 30 through 39 is 10 numbers right there so there's 10 different values that are associated with each bin uh, we can talk about uh, so, and we we can talk about our data class. Right? Uh, one class of data is what category? A class is a category. So our data class is here. Our first data class covers thirty through thirty-nine. We might say that the midpoint of the first data class. is the part that's halfway in between, right? That would be like 35, right? 
it's the halfway point to the 30s or maybe depending on how we look at our stuff right there 34.5 uh, depending on that right there. But the midpoint of the class, right? A data class is us saying, remember that all these data points right here are really um, spread out. We're making groups that we think that they belong to. It's pretty traditional in college classes to group things into groupings of 10 because we typically consider this like the A's, the B's, the C's, the D's, the F's down there, right? So that's the category. We're categorizing what is otherwise numerical data. So a data class is a category, right? So when you see the word class, that is just what which of the groups are we talking about so the first data class in this case uh, had a lower bound of 30 and an upper bound of 39 39 is the biggest you could be and still fall into the first data class associated with this histogram 35 if we were to draw this differently would be probably where the tick mark should be at the center of that histogram and you'll see again excel is going to draw these very slightly differently here um, so what we should do now is let's take a look at a few alternate versions of this in Excel. I'm not going to draw any more of these by hand, but I want to ask Excel to do these differently. What I would maybe like to do is change this bin width, right? Maybe what I want to see is a little bit more or a little bit less breakdowns of uh, where my students' grades live. So what I want to go do is have Excel do this for me. Um, the big takeaway with this is going to be, before I click away to our other screen here, is that there is always a, several histograms that might be sort of the best histogram. Eventually we'll get to some histograms that are really bad ideas that don't give us good sense of the information, but there's never really like one truly correct histogram for any situation. There's always choices that we're going to have out there and we need to be able to understand what are the good information, what are the bad information that we get out of each of these histograms. So the other thing that I'll say is even if you're not planning on doing this in Excel, you should still watch this part because I'm still going to talk about the choices that we want to make and what's good and what's bad about the graphs that we're making. I'm just going to have Excel make them because I'm certain that you guys are tired of watching me by hand do a bad job of making histograms uh, on, my, on my stylus and tablet here. So let's have Excel do some of this stuff for us here. Um, and again, you might be actually wanting my actual Excel instructions here, or maybe you just want to look at my graphs and see what I have to say about them. That choice is up to you. Um, uh, maybe last thing before I click away over to that, it should be the case that through your redwoods.edu email that you have access to the full Microsoft Office suite. So even if you don't have Excel, you should not have to pay for it. You should be able to find information at the Redwoods website. Uh, that will tell you how to kind of claim your your free uh, Microsoft Office stuff so that you have Microsoft Word, Excel, stuff like that. Um, it's free. I feel like you should get it. It's $100. If you don't have Microsoft Office stuff, it's expensive enough that you should just get it while you have a redwoods.edu thing. Um, and the stuff we're going to do in Excel this semester isn't going to be super crazy. Uh, you should probably do it uh, along with me. You definitely don't have to. You can do this by hand. Um, but I, I think it's going to be better for you to make these in Excel if, you, if you'd like to do that. So let's pop over to Excel and see what we got. Uh, as, as I go over to Excel, I just want to show you guys this data that's in the stem and leaf plot is the same data as what was originally given to us just in a list at the beginning. All right there we had our, our list right here. I have already typed this list into Excel. So in Excel, we're going to get over there and all that's in there is just exactly this data in a list and we'll, and we'll work from there. So here we go. Let's pop over to Excel here. So over in Excel, as promised, all we have is we're just looking at just the test scores that we're given right here. These are exactly the test score. As long as I typed them out correctly, these are exactly the test scores. So let's just see what the very default settings are. And then let's play with all the settings that Excel has to make some different graphs here. So I'm going to do like the, the least number of clicks possible to get a histogram on the screen. But then we'll all decide that we don't like some of the parts about it. So to make a, a, a histogram, all we got to do in Excel is go to the data analysis choice that's up here. Data analysis should be one of your options in here. If you don't have a data analysis option, then you should just do a quick Google and just Google Excel data analysis. And I promise the first hit that you're going to get is instructions for how to click a little button that will turn on this being an available option right here. So click data analysis. And what's going to happen is a very small window is going to pop up. Oh, it's not going to show this right here. Here. Okay, let me add this. I do want this to be visible. I'm going to add, uh, add window capture. Uh, add this. Nope, add a new one. Add the source. And... All right. 
Okay, you can see it now. So this little box just popped up on my Excel screen right there. It's a, it says just says data analysis and it lists a bunch of analysis tools. By the way, uh, I do want to say to you, like ANOVA, that's something we're doing this semester. We're going to compute some correlations. Covariance is not too hard. We don't cover it in this class, though. General descriptive statistics. We're going to uh, compute all of those by hand at the end of this chapter. Uh, we will not do any exponential smoothing. F-test two sample for variances. That's associated with the ANOVA. This will be our second to last chapter of this class. Fourier analysis. I don't know why that's in there. It's a calculus topic. There's the histogram that we're looking for. Um, you should see other things down here. All of these tests, these three t-tests and this z-test, we're also going to use all four of those semesters. So this data analysis thing is it, it, we're going to be here a couple times this semester here. So just so that you're aware, these are all relatively useful. Histograms is what we want right now. So I'm going to choose that and click OK. And it's going to pop up for you uh, a new window here. And I'm going to need to get that. OK, cool. It gave me, the, wait, it didn't. It's sharing this awful weird here. So let me add that as well right here. It's a new window capture. Add source, new source instead, add it. And let's also get our Excel histogram. Okay, so now it's also going to show us our Excel histogram information right here. And so this is going to give us all of our options. So the important parts of this are that it wants to know what input are we using, and it wants to know how it should provide the output to you. Right? The input that we need to give it are what is the input data? What bins are we using? We need to be able to tell it bins. We're going to skip that for now. And how do we output it? So here's the couple things I'm going to do. First, for the input range, you always have to deal with the input range. Right now, it's pre-selected only because I did this once before I started class to make sure I was going to do anything dumb. Um, so you should pretty much always click on the button that's next to it right here, at which point you will be able to select some data from your screen. So I am going to click and drag and notice I included test scores as a label on mine. I'll show you what to do with that in a second. So I'm gonna drag this out and I'm selecting all of my data. Now the little window that's sitting right here, I'm gonna just click that button on the side again. That's this button that's right over here and that'll say I'm done. Now it's got that data range sitting right here. I'm gonna go ahead and skip the bin range. I'm gonna tell it nothing and I'm gonna let it give me the default bin ranges that it picks. Here, I have labels clicked because I included test scores as a label to this column. If you don't have like a name up there as a column header, then you don't want to click labels. The only kind of thing to be careful with with labels is you need to be telling it for both your input range and the bin range if there were labels or not. So if there's gonna be a label selected on your data, then there should also be a label selected on your bin range. You can't really mix and match. It's got one option for this right here. Did you have a label for that column or no? And here I did, so I'm checking it yes. For my output op options, you can either tell it where to place the histogram on this page. You can tell it to make a new worksheet. So in our sheets down here, it'll pop up a new sheet, or you can tell it to make an entirely new Excel file with it on there. I think that's overkill. I usually put it on the same page or on a new sheet, uh, so I'll just leave that checked. Finally, down here, these three boxes. Do you want? Do we want it sorted? Well, definitely no in this case. I definitely want my 30s, then my 40s, then my 50s, then my 60s. It would be weird if those were in different orders to me. So since our x-axis has a normal ordering already, I don't want it to make. I don't want this to be in bar height from lowest to highest. That would be a confusing way to read that. So I definitely am not going to click Pareto. Cumulative percentage, this is just asking, do we actually want our cumulative frequencies rather than just the frequencies themselves? This is not technically a histogram if I click this, but this is very often a useful graph to see, but not in our case. Finally, this checkbox right here just says, do you even want me to graph anything on the other end or do you just want to tell me how many things fell in each bin? I do want an actual graph, so I am going to leave this checked right here. So what I'm expecting is when I click OK, it's going to create a new graph for me, but it's going to be on a new sheet. So it's just so down here, there's going to be a sheet two and it's going to have my response stuff on it. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And it pops up a new sheet. So notice down here it's on sheet two and it did two things for me. One, it told me, it made a little table of values for me as to what were the values that we see. And let me zoom in here. 
So here, it, it shows bins on its own, which are really screwy bins right there. You should see those are weird upper bounds. But it did appropriately lump the number of observations within that boundary uh, appropriately. So this is sort of our table description of the histogram. This is our frequency table. This is the actual histogram itself. Now immediately, the first thing that I am hoping that you're all saying is, Tony, that's not a histogram. There's a gap between the bars, and you are exactly correct. I don't like the fact that the histograms by default here are like this. If you're making these in Excel, I'm not gonna cry about it too much right here, um, but I, I like that I can fix this. If you wanna make these bars have no gap between them, you can right click on a bar. It's going to give you the choice. Okay, it brought up a little light, right click window that I know you can't see it right now. The final option on the right click options is format data series and when I click format data series it brings up a little side menu over here and gap width is one of our options and I'm just going to turn our gap width down to zero and notice that there's no now no gaps between these things so now this truly looks to me like I anticipate a histogram looking like right there right so we have made a histogram here um, our bins, it looks like this bin, now I want to kind of talk about this, I know this is kind of small scale right here, but you can see a tick mark, but what I don't like about Excel histograms is they don't put values at the tick marks. They reference this as the bin of 33, and what that really means is this is the bin that goes up to and including 33. This is the bin that goes up to and including 46.4. This is the bin that goes up to and including 86.6. So that means our final bin over here should just be basically like 87 and above. I kind of don't like this more fix that uh, Excel does right here. So they just have a and above right there. That actually fixes our issue because when I was doing this before, I really wanted like 90 and above to be my last category, even though it didn't have the same width overall. It was actually a little bit bigger than our previous bins were. This, in a sense, does do a good job of fixing the problem because it just makes a statement. It's like, end everything above that. Um, but I don't like that it's not like a numerical statement right there. It's not clear to me that the upper bound was 100, stuff like that. So I just want to show you guys now how we can manually do this and how I think that you should be doing this in your homework for the written homework assignment that I've got. And when I say written, I really mean the like, not my open math homework. So let's just make one more here. And I want to show you how to do this with custom bins and then we'll, we'll call it a day. So what I much more typically do is I really rarely let Excel choose bins for me because I know more than nothing about stats and I have a good sense of maybe how I want my data to be spread. Maybe I'm thinking to myself, the breakdown of tens is a really good breakdown because it is, because we do to usually do things like 90s are A's, 80s are B's, 70s are C's. Typically, that's like a pr pretty typical thing, right? So tens maybe make sense. Maybe we want to pick a different breakdown though. Maybe we want to count by like eights, all right? Let's just do eights here just to see what this is going to look like. Let's do you know, what I'm, what I usually do. And again, this is, this is a Tony thing right here. This isn't a, uh, a standard stats thing is I want to make a, a, a list of what I think my bin boundaries should be so that I can tell those to Excel. But usually I make lots of these. So I'm going to call this one bins eight because this tells me, Tony, not telling Excel, this tells Tony that my bins are going to be like eight units wide. So what I kind of think that I want to do now in this case is, I don't know, I guess I'm just going to look down at my lowest data point of this 33 down here and pick um, a lower bound, and gosh, I it shouldn't really matter too much how we end up picking this. In some cases it can, but uh, it really hopefully shouldn't make a huge distinction on how things are gonna go. The only thing I'm thinking to myself here is I would kind of like this to land cleanly at uh, an upper bound of 100 up there. Um, so I'm just trying to think of some quick mental math to figure out how I can make that land there, but. Uh, Maybe I'm just really not too worried about that. So let's just start doing some things because again, this should be more about getting stuff out there and looking at the graph and deciding for yourself if this was a good call or not. So I'm just going to kind of start down here at 30 as a lower bound. I'm thinking of 30 as the bottom of my first bin. And I'm counting by eight. So I'm just going to do 38, 46. By the way, it should be the case now that Excel is smart enough to see this trend. So I'm going to grab these three and click on the box down here in the corner and make sure I get that black cursor. And as I drag these out, Excel should know how to count by eights. 
you can't see it on the screen that I'm sharing right now, but where my cursor is, it's telling me what it thinks it should be putting in that box. And it's, and it is counting by eights and I can see that it's getting them correct right there. So it, I just dragged it out and it made those bins for me. Right? So let's just make one more giving it these bins and see how it's going to look a little bit different out here. So now I'm going to go back to data analysis. I'm going to select histogram again. Okay. It's already still got the input range held over and I can see that because I can see the dashed line around it. What I now want to do is give it a bin range. So I'm going to click on my thing right here that allows me to select. Because I included the label of test scores with my data, I am also going to include a label of bins 8 that I gave it for my histogram right here. Since I'm done selecting, I can go ahead and click this little button right there to tell it I'm done. Uh, I did have labels on both, so I'll leave that checked. And this one, maybe let's just put it on the same page. I'm going to tell it where I want it. I'm going to select an output range here. And notice output range is going to give us another little option right here. This one's nice because you can be a little bit lazier with this one. When I do this one to select where I want it, you can just go ahead and click just any one cell. So I'm just going to click that one cell and it's going to then put everything like sort of in a box like out here. That'll be the upper left corner of where it puts all your stuff. Um, and so I've selected that. And so now again, I can go ahead and click this button over here to say I'm done picking that stuff. And now I'm good with everything else. I do want it to chart the output, but I want it to do it just on this page. So I'm going to click OK. And it popped us up our frequency table right here with how many things fell into each bin and uh, the actual histogram itself over here. I kind of feel like this might be a slightly better histogram over here, by the way. I feel like I'm getting maybe a slightly better sense of where the where the data is spread right here. Um, our peak in the 70s does not look as extreme to me anymore, but that's because it's not the 70s anymore. It's just 70 up to 78 right here. Notice a couple other things. It looks like this bin of 30. When I included this 30, it turns out that was meaningless because no scores were below the 30 grouping right there. There was only one score that was below 38. There's the one score that was below 38. Uh, below 46, but above 38. Below 46, but above 38, there was only one score. Below 54, but above 46. It looks like we had three scores right there. So here's all the frequencies that we're doing. Um, notice here, it's always going to include the more category. Here, 102 was our upper bound. This went from, um, from 95 to 102. And from 95 to 102, there were two responses right there. And so we did get two as our frequency in the frequency table right there. So the point of this is to say, I pretty typically make like, in this case, I would probably make like a bins four, bins five, bins six, bins seven, bins eight, bins nine, bins 10. And I would probably make like six or seven different histograms and stop and look at all of them and say, hmm, which one of these do I think is being the best representation of the data? The thing that we just really want to avoid here, and I give a highlight of this in the homework is, if we did our bins, like a bins 20 in this case, then I'm really not going to get a good sense of my data. If each bin contains 20 data values, right? There are 20 possible outputs of data right there. Then we're really losing sense of a trend. On the other hand, if I just did bins one and counted by ones, then we're going to have a ton of columns. Most of them are going to be empty. And again, that makes it really hard for us to see trends in our data. So it's really typical that pretty much all good histograms of the world have like five to 15 bins. That's not a rule. I just don't know if I've ever seen what I would consider a great histogram that had like more than 15 bins or less than five bins. It's, it's you're, you're always kind of like not seeing something that you want to be able to see uh, when you either spread your data out a lot or group it all up together. Um, it makes it harder to make those interpretations. So when you go to do the homework, you should just make a ton of these lists, then make all of their respective histograms, then stop and look at each of them and say, which one of these is giving me what I think is the best visual sense of the data? Um, and so pick these bins, make sure that you understand that when you're looking at the frequency table over here, what it's really trying to tell you, stop and say to yourself, wait a minute, 30 and 38 have a zero and one. Like, what does that mean? Come over here and look at your data and make sure that you can kind of interpret what Excel means when it set, puts this bin number next to a frequency count right there. Make sure that you agree with that being the same thing that's being made in the histogram. Um, 
Yeah, so this is some of the things I'll ask you to play around with in the homework. In the homework, I'm going to ask you to make some histograms that are going to end up being bad. And I want you to tell me why they're going to be bad. Um, they're going to be overgrouped, right? If we only had like three categories for this, it's not a very good sense of what's really happening right here. So in the homework, you're going to make some. Again, you can either do these in Excel or by hand. You should realize that doing this by hand is really not that hard at all. Um, all you've got to do is visually look and say things like, all right, there's the data points in the first group, so one of them, and then two in the second, or excuse me, three in the second group or something, and then, oh, three in the third group. Like, it's, it's pretty easy to count your frequencies if you have an ordered list right there. So by hand or Excel is acceptable. So um, that's going to be, I think this is my kind of wrap up right here. I'm trying to, trying to wrap this up anyway. Um, I'm just looking to see, did I have any other statements I wanted to say at the end of this here? Um, Nope. Our, our just come back to our big takeaway here. You got to play around with histograms. Uh, there's never been a point in my life where I've just made one histogram and been like, cool, there it is. Um, it's always a try a couple, see what you feel like is the best representation of the data and see if you can come up with a one sentence statement as to why you think one is better than another. That's the type of stuff I'll ask you to do in the homework. So I guess my only other thing before I sign off here is remember that we are maybe going to adjust our schedule next week by a day since technically next Monday is a no school day. That's really just going to depend on if I am still on vacation that morning and driving back or not. Um, and so, I don't know, I'll hit you guys up with a Canvas message. I'm hoping it doesn't really affect uh, any of your schedules that much. Um, I'm not gonna change deadlines for things since all of our deadlines are two week spans anyway. Um, so deadlines should all be the same. It just might be the case that we do Tuesday, Wednesday instead of Monday, Tuesday next week. But again, I haven't even decided. I'll send you guys all a Canvas announcement on like Friday once I know for sure what I'm doing. So again, that wraps up our two, one, and two, two. Um, the things that you should be prepared for is if you have been, again, I don't, I don't wanna say like this has been boring, but I imagine that a handful of you are probably not too thrilled with just doing vocab for two weeks. We're really into the computation and making numerical distinction part of the class really truly begins uh, next week. So I'm excited for next week's class to arrive. This stuff is important, but this stuff is all kind of just vague and a bunch of words until we really put the numerical parts to it. And that's all coming starting next week here. So um, make sure that we're all good with our graphical displays. Be sure that you're confident in your histograms more than any other graphical display. Um, you have your first written homework this week, aside from just my open math stuff. So make sure you're looking at that, making it some nice clean looking PDFs for me. Uh, and as usual, if you got any questions, you're certainly welcome to email me, come to our office hours, all that good stuff. Um, send me my open math messages, all those things. Um, so stay in touch if you got the questions. Um, otherwise, I'll be seeing you for the next lecture video on either Monday or Tuesday of next week. And we'll get into that will be all of our measures of center and measures of spread. So on Monday, Tuesday or Tuesday, Wednesday next week, we'll talk mean, median, mode, uh, standard deviation and quartiles are kind of the core things to discuss next week. When is it appropriate to use which measures of center, which measures of spread? We'll talk left skew, right skew, symmetric histograms, all that kind of good stuff next week. So I'm looking forward to getting into some computation there. Uh, have a good week. Contact me if you got any questions. Otherwise, I'll see you guys for more Chapter 2 next week. Have a good one.